Hello and welcome back to Documentary Film. And this week's module is on the documentary modes. These are the six modes that Bill Nichol speaks about. Um, the poetic, expository, participatory, observational, reflective, and performative. Uh, this week, both films, our feature film Baraka, and also uh, Man with a Movie Camera, which is a film I'd like you to have a look at, or at least as much as you can. Uh, but our feature film and our quiz film is Baraka, so keep that in mind. So, uh, for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about uh, these modes uh, that documentary films can be presented in. Uh, quite often, these modes can coexist in the same film. Uh, the two films, the two main films for this week, have primarily speaking a poetic mode now what is a poetic mode what that is is it's an unconventional style of filmmaking not bizarre and strange to follow but it really functions on a different level on an intuitive level on an emotional level on a rhythmic level it's less concerned with telling a clear story with a clear uh, narrative, a beginning, middle, and an end, for example, but is more concerned with kind of a non-narrative, non-linear experience. Uh, the film sometimes it can be considered as cumulative. Uh, a series of events occur, and there's a kind of overall idea that is presented, uh, but it takes having to watch the entire film to come to that conclusion. So yes, it's unconventional, it's non-narrative, it's experimental. Uh, it's very close to some of the uh, montage styles that we're going to be talking about uh, with Eisenstein very briefly, specifically tonal, overtonal, and intellectual. So those we're going to talk about uh, very shortly, but it is really very much concerned with this style of, of film uh, editing, montage editing. Uh, it is observational as well, because the the presence of the camera doesn't change into a significant degree the events that are unfolding in front of it. Uh, quite often in Baraka, we have uh, individuals, subjects in the film that look directly at the camera. Now, that does not mean that the camera is controlled to any degree their events or their faces or their characteristics. The camera does look at them and they look back at the camera. But overall, it is a kind of poetic style. So that's what I would like you to think about here, uh, because last week we looked at primarily expository films. And these are the proverbial voice of God, straightforward narratives. The uh, the image supersedes the voice, or sorry, the, uh, I'm sorry, the other way around. Uh, the image is at the service of the voice. The voice is everything, because it is a voice of God narration. That means that there is a very direct control over the narrative flow, the relationship between images and, and the voice, or images and music sometimes, but they all serve a final purpose. And that final purpose, typically with an expository film, is education. They tend to be ped pedagogical. In other words, that's a fancy word for just educational. Uh, today and for this week, the two films, Baraka and Man with a Movie Camera, uh, primarily are falling under the poetic category. Although each has their own sort of uh, secondary political agenda, and we're going to talk about that, but these are primarily poetic films. Uh, this is the quote to start with uh, by Tsiga Vertov. Uh, Tsiga Vertov uh, in Russian translates to spinning top which is kind of interesting because the film is very kaleidoscopic and it moves and shifts from one space to the next and it uses a whole range of filmic devices, uh, speeding up film, slowing down film, stop motion, uh, multiple overlays. So it is a kind of spinning top. It's a really wonderful, fil wonderful film to watch and experience, a uh, man with a movie camera that is. But let's kind of start with that before we move into information about our feature. So uh, Ziga Vertov writes, I am an eye. I am a mechanical eye. I am a machine. I am showing you the world, the lights of which only I can see. And what he means by that is this wonderful new gift that has been given to us at the beginning of the previous century, which is the movie camera. Uh, the still camera had been around since roughly eight, mid 1840s, more or less. It had been around for a long time. Uh, so at this point, roughly 60 to 70 years. But what is now brand new is a movie camera. It is going to capture movement. And we can see just the sheer joy that uh, Vertov has in just filming the world, 
filming Russia, fil filming uh, the Soviet Union and it, in its in its newness, in this sort of this new dawn, because it has now experienced a revolution. Because remember, this is the early 20s. Uh, the revolution is now more or less over the at least the violent part right the the revolutionary warfare and now things are settling down into this new way of life so imagine being able to see this new way of life with a mechanical eye right that camera eye that is looking at the world in these utterly new ways so this is kind of what makes uh man with a movie camera so remarkable it is a film that really enjoys uh the ability of the camera to do things that the eye cannot so um, there is for sure uh, certain similarities in this film uh, that we find in certain avant-garde movies that are out around the same time. And most of these are all also silent films. Um, we haven't had a chance to watch any of them, but you can certainly find a copy of uh, Un Chien Andalou. The Andalusian Dog is what it translates to into English, which is a very important and famous film by Louis Binuel. Um, you'll find those and other, other films by uh, Binuel there are films that are being made in the Soviet Union, in France, uh, some early uh, avant-garde films also being made in the U.S. But here, as uh, with avant-garde, is there is in so-called narrative film, documentary film, uh, a huge amount of experimenting. The template has not been set yet for filmmaking looking a certain way. So there is a tremendous amount of experimenting, of just joy, being able to do the things that it can do, uh, overlaps and dissolves and stop motion and uh, things moving forwards and backwards. These kinds of things are revolutionary because it is the first time we're seeing them uh, in, a, in a filmic medium. So Benuel uh, sort of identifies for us that link between the avant-garde tendencies, which are again, purely experimental, and then what we see in Vertov's film, which is experimenting at the service of an idea, right? The idea of this new world presented in a new way. So Benoel says, all of us were supporters of a certain concept of, of revolution, uh, cinematic or otherwise, political revolution. And although the surrealists didn't consider themselves terrorists, they were constantly fighting a society they despised. So the surrealists and other avant-garde uh, filmmakers and artists, uh, and writers as well, we're trying to get the world to see itself through new eyes, through a fresh pair of eyes. And what better way to do it than with this revolutionary new tool called a camera. And so uh, Mikhail Kaufman, uh, uh, Diego Vertov's brother, uh, because uh, both brothers, of course, original names were Kaufman and uh, Mikhail Kaufman, who was uh, Tiga Vertov's principal cinematographer, he's a gentleman that we see throughout the film. Now, is the film, uh, to go back and make sure I've got my terms uh, correct, uh, participatory or performative? Well, yes and no. What is happening is we are seeing people respond to the presence of a camera, which is probably something they're seeing for the first time, but it is still primarily poetic. And this is what I want to stress when Bill, Bill Nichol talks about these six modes of documentary filmmaking. Quite often, the two can coexist. By all means, it's not contradictory. They can work very well together. You can make an expository film that is also poetic. The first few minutes of uh, the John Grierson film that we watched last week uh, has both of those. It has the kind of the, a sense of a, the voice of God narration, although it is intertitles, but at times very poetic. So Mikhail Kaufman says, we all felt that through documentary film, we could develop a new kind of art, not only documentary art or the art of chronicle, right? To chronicle and depict certain things, but rather an art based on images, right? The creation of an image oriented journalism. So a kind of journalism based on uh, pictorial information and pictorial information in a film isn't just a still image. That still image has a sense of shape and size and mass and kinetic energy sometimes. Uh, of course, at this point, it's in black and white. It's not color yet. But even within that early formulation, we start seeing the potential of the moving image rather than the still image. And this is very early on in the 1920s, but uh, filmmakers like Sigur Vertov, uh and also Eisenstein, Sergei Eisenstein, begin to think about what they're doing. Think about this new art 
based on moving images. Again, not still images, because we've had uh, pictorial art for hundreds of years at this point, um, and the, the, not the movie camera, but the still camera around for roughly 60 to 70 years at this time. But what is utterly brand new is the moving image, right? The moving picture, which is this brand new tools that we, uh, tool that we can see the world through a fresh new set of eyes. So uh, Tigo Vertov started making uh, films as early as 1922, which is, as the slides point out, the same year that Nanuka the North came out. And uh, the work that they were doing was under the title Kino Pravda. And Kino Pravda means film truth in Russian. And the notion that you could, you could somehow capture the truth of something through film, the degree of self-reflexivity that we find sort of as early as the 1970s and 80s, the fact that the notion of truth is provisional, it's contingent, uh, it's often fleeting, but there is at least an attempt to find some version of the truth out there. But at this early point, the notion of Kino Pravda or film truth was something that many filmmakers believed in. They believed that film could capture truth more effectively because it also had motion right? Uh, a camera could reframe. So imagine the ability to reframe a picture without losing its the impact. Uh, editing, again, becomes very, very important. And so these are all the kinds of ideas that are happening this early. Uh, and especially in Russia, there is I would like to argue more experimenting in Russia and in France than there is in the U.S. Uh, the U.S. is more concerned with simply uh, documenting, uh, documenting events. Uh, the the Hollywood film industry, or at least the film industry, is already beginning in earnest at this point because um, Birth of a Nation and other films are already, already out. So the notion of narrative seems to take precedence in the U.S. more so than it does in France and in, and in Russia. And it is there that we find more experimenting. Uh, you know, the, the notion that somehow you can use film to capture life unaware, right? To, re to reveal some kind of deeper truth that the that our eye could not perceive. And so this is why Zurziga Zvertov uh, is able to say that I am a mechanical eye. He's looking through the camera lens and that lens and that camera allows him to do things in the most remarkable kinds of ways. So Vertov sees humanity, the, at least the future of humanity, as a kind of interface with technology. And uh, to say the least, he was correct because uh, automation really has pointed the way to that uh, AI, right? artificial intelligence also. But this is an early positive embrace of the inter interaction between technology and humanity. So it's looked at in positive artistic ways that this essentially is a good thing. So in terms of theory, though, uh, Vertov is trying to break down these barriers that somehow is implying that the camera is is a is a sort of an intrusion. Uh, it's it stands between the eye and real life. So this is what I mean when the kind of self reflexivity that is occurring much later on, as bodies and bodies of films are being put out in various countries, that that we now begin to sit back and begin asking ourselves, you know, uh, who's whose agenda is being served by the presentation of these images. And so the way in which we interpret real life at this early point is probably not as problematic as it is now, where, as we have with Bill Nickel, a more recent mode, which is the reflective, right? So self-reflective, self-reflexive as well. Uh, it's challenging our ability to capture this truth that at this early point in the 1920s, uh, the fact that film truth was this kind of new form of uh, truth, perhaps a better version. But we know that our eye cannot stop motion. It can't reverse motion. Uh, it can't overlap multiple images. Yes, film can, but this, the human eye cannot. So we need to ask ourselves, ultimately, what are the, the comparisons and the contrasts between the eye and the camera? So we know that the camera can do so much more than the human eye. Double exposures, fast motion, slow motion, freeze frames, jump cuts, split screen, uh, even tilted split screens. Uh, there's a couple of times in, in Man with a Movie Camera where the shots are, are brought together 
in terms of a split screen, but the split screen itself is now at an oblique angle. So it's sort of tilted into each other and really cool stuff. Uh, it's This is the film that's aged very, very well because it reminds us of some of the better music videos that we've seen over the last, you know, 10 years or so, uh, although they have been around since the 80s. And just trust me, some of the better film uh, videos, even back in the 80s, were using ideas that were presented this far back right in the early 20s in films like Man with a Vo uh, Movie Camera. So all this kind of stuff that is specific to the camera and not to the eye is really brought to the forefront for the first time in a document, not necessarily a documentary, but in a document like Man with a Movie Camera, as well as early avant-garde films being made along the same lines. Now, what is uh, kind of interesting with this film is the fact that it is purely experimental. And it's experimental uh, in the actual cinematic transmission, right? It is going to show us, visually speaking, the world around us. Now, certainly the world in the Soviet Union in the early 20s. Uh, and it's going to do it without the use of intertitles. Now, what is that? That's the voice of God, right? The expository intertitles to help to direct our understanding and help to direct our interpretation of these images. So they're gone. So this is the film without intertitles. So there's there's no guidance. We are simply going to watch this film and let it sort of work its magic upon us. It's also a film that was shot without a script. Now, surely it had an editing script, absolutely. But a script in terms of the written word or the spoken word, none. So there is no uh, no sense of a narrative being presented other than sort of a, a cumulative visual narrative. And finally, it's also shot without the help of a theater. Now, what they mean uh, is it's a film without actors, without sets. Everything takes place in the great outdoors. Uh, we can see uh, several times, I wouldn't call it reflexive in the sense that Bill Nichol uh, calls it, but there is a self-awareness that here is a shot of a cameraman in the film. Uh, and the whole time, there's a kind of a joyous, giddy feeling all the way through that just look what we can do, right? Look what this camera can do. It's, it's incredible. So we see lots of movements of, of cameras out in the, out in the street, uh, on the back of trucks, for example. And not only do we see the shot that the camera is taking, but then we see another shot of the cameraman taking the shot we have just seen. So there's this constant, constant doubling back and reminding us, this is what the camera can do. This is how joyous the life can be. Now, uh, Diga Vertov was uh, creating this film from what we would call perhaps a, a Marxist perspective. Uh, perspective. Uh, there's been a communist revolution in Russia by this point. It is now known as the Soviet Union, no longer Russia. And so the film tries to depict to us what the future of the Soviet Union could be. And what is interesting is we see both men and women working in factories. We see uh, a degree of, of equality where uh, it is sort of implied that everyone can participate in the generation of this new world, even though we, we do see uh, people that are probably homeless. They're, they look like they're sleeping out on the streets. Uh, the film doesn't question that to the degree that we would today. Uh, they're simply there, right? They're simply there and they're, they're part of the, the city waking up, right? Waking up for the first time. And it is kind of interesting because we see people literally, again, from all walks of life that are waking up. So we see the rich and the poor, those who, the, the haves and the have nots. And so this kind of new future, right? This future that is just on, on the, on the cusp of this world that is about to turn this remarkable corner. And we're able to see it and to witness it using this brand new tool called a moving camera. Now, one of the ideas that are, is also presented is the fact that narrative film or documentary film, uh, documentary film is leaning more towards you know, towards pravda, right? Towards truth. While narrative film is associated now with sort of the traditional, you know, the novel, the great historical novel, the, the great unwashed story of humanity. Uh, that is now what's being looked at as the opiate of the masses. And that's, of course, a line from Marx. 
he says uh, he calls actually religion the opiate of the people but there's a relationship between the notion of, of uh, dumbing down an opiate being given to the people in the form of narrative film uh, a film that tells a story a film that keeps people sort of in their place and this new kino pravda right this new film truth is going to agitate people but in a positive way uh, this this kind of filmmaking was also known as agit prop right it's uh, agitating propaganda so it's agitating people to a, in a positive degree, to go out and do things and create this world, bring it into being. Uh, and this is the reason why the, we see the Bolshoi Ballet collapsing in on itself, because the Bolshoi Ballet is looked at in the same way as narrative film and traditional storytelling. Again, a kind of opiate of the masses. So we don't want that, right? We want, we want pravda, we want the truth. And as I've pointed out, all the way through the film, we see the, the cameramen, uh, you know, that are on trains, uh, filming trains uh, from high, low angles. We see them in the back of trucks driving around the city. We see them up in the very top of a, of a of a large, you know, three or four story building looking down at the roads. So presenting to us this new world, this new future from a range of interesting perspectives, perspectives that often we could not uh, do using just the, the, the naked eye. So we've got the movement with the camera, uh, fast and slow motion, the editing room with the individual scenes that are being cut, and we see the actual editing of the film. So again, a kind of self-reflexivity, not in a questioning sort of way, but in a kind of giddy, joyous, you know, here's how we did this. Isn't this remarkable? So we have the editing room as a kind of mini factory to create all this, all this new truth. Uh, so this notion of a filmmaker connected with with factory working and what that does too from a Marxist perspective is it it equates and levels the playing field between the factory worker that creates things and the artist that creates products right uh, creative products and they're both looked at as equally important so the the city itself Moscow is giving birth to the filmmaker giving birth to the filmic uh, tradition and especially it is a kind of rebirth of that city that we're seeing so Vertov ultimately he believes that the camera really could go anywhere. If it could could if it could fly, he would have been happy. If you could attach it to a drone, for example, he would have been even happier. But there is the notion that the camera can literally go anywhere. Um, it is not having to follow either the laws of logic or even gravity for that matter, and it can see the world in a in a range of different ways, moving backwards, forwards, stopping motion, uh, doubling up and dissolves and so on all the things that an eye cannot do. So um, you, we see a, a cameraman inside a beer glass at one point, we see a cameraman, you know, on top of another cameraman. And a lot of it, if, if you're, if you kind of chuckle, if you kind of get yourself caught up in the energy of the movie, because it, the movie is very, very energetic and it never lets go. Uh, even though it runs almost an hour, it doesn't feel like an hour. It literally feels like it's about 10 minutes because once it gets going and the, and the city sort of wakes up, that's when things are moving at a rapid pace. But Vertov is simply showing us that the movie or the, the film camera, the, the moving camera, can literally go anywhere and see everything. It isn't held back by the limitations that we have as human beings. So uh, do have a look at it, uh, Man with a Movie Camera, Tsiga Vertov, uh, and when you have a chance to to go through uh the film then uh have a look at the second set of slides which i'm going to start very briefly when we talk about eisenstein and his various uh, montage effects okay so we're on to our second set of slides uh this is baraka and uh, this is our feature presentation and uh, what, what i mean by that is it also happens to be the film that you will be quizzed on so do pay, uh, pay attention to it uh, there is a beautiful beautiful high def print that's available on youtube uh, in widescreen as well so do take advantage of it if you can get youtube on your television i strongly recommend that you watch it on a large screen because it is quite overwhelming now, uh, it is our feature film. It is our quiz film. Uh, so the quiz uh, for next for this coming week, which opens tomorrow, January 5th, you're maybe watching this on Monday or Tuesday, but it opens on January 5th, uh, 25th, sorry, and finishes up on the tw on the 31st. So you have uh, about a week or so to to write that quiz. Okay, so I mentioned uh, about Sergei Eisenstein being uh, an important film theorist in the um, in the early 1920s and he wrote two books 
this one here film form which is the book I'm going to use to talk about and the other one is this one here film sense so in film form Eisenstein talks about uh, these methods of montage which are really quite important okay sorry about that someone just came to the door okay so uh, we talked in the first part of this uh, video on Tika Vertov's man with a movie camera and now we're going to switch gears and speak a little bit more about Baraka if you hear yelling in the background that's just my grandson who's really happy to be here and just loves to express himself so please disregard that no one's being hurt so uh, Eisenstein, uh, writing in the, in the early 1920s, uh, became very concerned with not only the fact that a movie camera could capture moving images, which is clearly what it does, uh, and what Tiga Vertov was doing with the camera, which is uh, stop motion, uh, speeding up, slowing down, reversing fi film, uh, dissolves, and so on. Eisenstein took it much further and began to think about the art of editing. And editing isn't just editing shots together in order to tell a story but he came up with something that's even more unique and very specific to cinema which is montage um, montage it's uh it's french uh montage it means mounting and mounting a film together in order for the the images the visual language right because that's what this is it's a it's a brand new visual language and eisenstein wanted to understand what this what this language could do. What were the different ways in which a, a shot, like an individual shot could mean something, but more important, what was film, but a group of shots, the length of a single shot, and the next shot that comes after, and the shot that came before, how are those all together going to work? So he sat down and tried to sort of uh, figure out what was going on. And he came up with five different things. Now, I'll, I'll very briefly tell you. Okay, so the five methods of montage are the following. Metric, which is cut according to exact measurements in terms, in terms of time, regardless of the content. Two, rhythmic, cut according to the contents of the shots. This would be known as a sort of a continuity editing. Uh, also called match on action. If you... Uh, it's if you pay attention to any narrative film and you notice that let's say somebody walks up to a door and opens the door the the shot is cut to the next shot which is usually on the other side of the door and the idea is that the match on action the cut is occurring at the same time as someone is doing something and your eye is sort of momentarily distracted from the uh, from the editing through the movement you see on the screen so there's that, that kind of uh, rhythmic editing there. Are, and the, the three that really matter for today's films are tonal, overtonal, and intellectual. And so tonal is cutting according to the emotional tone of the piece, the overall uh, sense of the piece. Overtonal is cutting according to the tone or overtones of individual shots. And intellectual is cut according to the shots relationships to intellectual concepts and ideas. So I know I've just sort of briefly went through them, but I'm gonna read a little bit more here so we have a better sense of what Eisenstein is talking about. And again, this is coming from film form. Okay, so he says there are formal categories of montage that we know. Uh, I still really like Eisenstein's ideas and I am willing to argue with anyone that we really have not advanced much further because if you watch the, the short YouTube video on Eisenstein's montage techniques, most of the examples are very, very new uh, over the, you know, the last 30 or 40 years maximum. Uh, and we can find more films even today that still do the same sort of thing. So depending on who the filmmaker is, whether they even know what they're doing, and I'm not saying that they're hacks, but are aware, I should say, are aware of Eisenstein's ideas. They're doing what Eisenstein was discussing, such as these. Okay, metric montage. The fundamental criterion for this construction is the absolute lengths of the pieces. The pieces are joined together according to their lengths in a formula scheme corresponding to the measure of music, for example. Realization is a repetition of these measures. And we see in the clip um, a, a battle sequence. So what happens is a very sort of specific rhythm is set up because each of the shots are like, let's say, three seconds long or two seconds long. It doesn't matter. But we see a kind of uh, st steady staccato of images uh, that are disruptive. And of course, during a war sequence, that's ideal because you want it to be disruptive. So 
Eisenstein says if we cut each one exactly the same length, there's both a kind of consistent rhythm and yet a kind of jarring uh, effect because it's cut almost arbitrarily. It isn't, but it's arbitrary in terms of the content. So it creates a specific effect. Number two, rhythmic montage. Here in determining the lengths of the pieces, the content within the frame, in other words, the content of what we see is a factor possessing equal rights to consideration. Uh, abstract determ determination of the piece length gives way to a flexible relationship of the actual lengths. So depending on what we see in the shot, we are able to then formulate an idea as to when a, a, a good time would be to, to cut. So the structure of the film, the montage of the film, because that's the artistic part of it, the artistic montage has to do with not only the content, but the duration of a particular shot. And there's a sense of rhythm, a sense of flow in the film that really works well when there's a conscious effort to match up the content. And of course, it's just moving content with the duration of the shot. And that's essentially what he's talking about here. Now, these three, the next three, tonal, overtonal, and intellectual, really matter with the films that we're seeing today with Baraka and the man with a, with a movie camera. So, tonal montage. And he says right here in the book, this term is employed for the first time. It expresses a stage beyond rhythmic montage. So this is where Eisenstein's genius really comes in. He realizes that the order of, of shots in the plural really has a lot to do with the emotional and intellectual impact. And of course, these are pedagogical films because they try to educate the public, some of whom may not know, you know how to read very well, but are being entertained with these stories that are also trying to to educate and have some pedagogical feeling to them. So he goes back to tonal montage. It expresses the stage beyond rhythmic montage. In rhythmic montage, it is movement within the frame that impel the montage movement from frame to frame. In other words, from shot to shot. Such movements within the frame may be of objects in motion or the spectator's eye directed along the line of some immobile, ob uh, immobile object. So this is, um, again, what would be a shot counter shot, for example, a uh, discussion or a uh, conversation between two people. We see one uh, character sort of slightly off left and they're talking to someone else and the reverse shot, they're slightly off right. And we know that it's a conversation between these two people who are looking at each other. You could also have a shot of someone looking at something. And then there is a, there's a, a you know, uh, a plate of food on a table. And so we see the person looking and then we see the thing seen by the person looking. That's, that's part of what's going on here, but there's something more going on. In tonal montage, movement is perceived in a wider sense. The concept of movement embraces all affects of the montage piece. Here, montage is based on the characteristic emotional sound of the piece, of its dominant, the general tone of the piece. And so what's happening here now is there is an awareness of a kind of uh, sort of combination of shots together and how they will now move something to a higher level so that we have, let's say, two or three shots together and we have a certain feeling. And this is not just an emotional feeling, you know, here we want you to cry, but there is there's something else that is going on in terms of what he says, the the affect of the montage. Uh, rapid montage uh, will obviously agitate people, will excite people. Something that is much slower and more stately is going to put people into a different point, uh, you know, different viewpoint. But all of these are affects of the montage. They are going to affect the viewer in some way uh, to speed up the heart rate or slow it down. Uh, these things are very important to Eisenstein because they are now a way to, well, We'd like to say persuade the emotions of the viewer. Um, other people that aren't big fans of this will say, you know, manipulate or coerce. But I think here the the construction of the montage through various length shots or exactly the same if it is simply metric um, has a lot to do with the way in which the film will impact the viewer. So Eisenstein goes further with overtonal montage. In my opinion, says he, Overtonal montage, as described in the preceding essay, is organically the furthest development along the line of tonal montage. As I have indicated, it is distinguished from tonal montage by the collective calculation of all the pieces' appeals. So now it's thinking of the entire 
It could be the entire sequence that is considered as a whole. How do we move ourselves towards this final end? Um, there are examples in the short uh, little, like, I think it's about five minutes long. And it, uh, do have a look at it because, uh, again, there's not a test on this, but it is a really interesting way for you to learn the vocabulary of film language to say, oh, yeah, this would be tonal, overtonal. This is rhythmic. Um, you know, th this is metric. Uh, these things are important because it's a good way to be able to express ideas about film in the correct language. Uh, because any film student, I mean, we had to learn all this stuff as film students at Concordia back in the 80s when I learned it. Uh, but what became really useful was when two st film students are discussing an idea with a professor and you could use, you know, overtonal montage, everyone knew what you meant. And then you could further discussion further. Um, okay, so this characteristic steps up the impression from a melodically emotional coloring to a directly physiological perception. This too represents a level related to the previous levels. These four categories are methods of the montage. They become montage constructions proper when they enter into relations of conflict with each other, with each other, as in the example cited. And he gives a series of examples. But this is quite remarkable because even as early as the 1920s, Eisenstein and other thinkers were very clear as to what the potential of film moving images could do, not just the capturing of, of image, of an image or a single shot, but more importantly, the editing, the montage, the piecing together, the mounting of this idea in visual terms, this became very important. So uh, finally, intellectual montage. Intellectual montage is montage not of generally physiological overtonal sounds, but of sounds and overtones of an intellectual sort. Conflict ju juxtaposition of an accompanying intellectual effects. The gradational quality is here determined by the fact that there is no difference in principle between the motion of a man rocking on the, the, under the influence of elementary metric montage, see above, and the influence uh, the intellectual process within it. For the intellectual process is the same agitation, both in the dominion of the higher nerve centers. Okay, so that's kind of fancy language, I apologize. But what Eisenstein is saying to us is that the film has a message. It has an intellectual point of view that it wishes to present to us. For example, with Ziga Vertov's Man with a Movie Camera, it is this radical new way of seeing a radical new world. So the way in which this world is brand new, right? It's just starting out. It's, it's, it's depicted to us in these radically new ways. So it marries up an intellectual idea with a political idea. So um, this is kind of the long and the short of Eisenstein. Um, these things are worth knowing because they are important and we will see other filmmakers use the same kinds of ideas. So do have a look at the, the short five minute uh, clip Eisenstein uh, montage and especially look at the examples because the examples really sort of bring home these ideas that sound a little wordy on paper, I admit. But when we see them played out visually, we can go, oh yeah, this is, this is what overtonal montages, right? The intellectual montage, but it is worth knowing. Okay, so uh, Baraka. So let's go, go on to Baraka and talk a little bit more about uh, that. Okay, we just spoke about Man with a Movie Camera, but now let's move on to our feature. Um, produced in 70 millimeter film. So this is uh, very sort of the biggest uh, at that time format for film. Uh, huge gradation of colors and textures. Uh, it was shot in 152 different locations in 24 different countries. So truly a global film. Uh, Baraka is a Sufi word meaning blessing or uh, as the essence, the, the essence of a particular thing. Again, like Man with a Movie Camera, uh, it has no dialogue. It has no, again, no theatrical presentations. There are no actors. There are no subtitles, so it's not expository. There is no plot. Again, not expository. Uh, but certainly we can ask yourself, how does this give us the impression that Baraka is meant to be a global film? Well, if you look to the second statement here, it is literally shot around the world. Now, we have more than 24 countries, yes, but it's shot uh, with a global sense, a global expanse. So we are looking literally around the world and we're looking for things that are striking and unique that are essential to that particular place that we're seeing, hence the title uh, Baraka. Now, Marshall McLuhan 
uh, a, a Canadian sort of thinker and theorist about uh, about mass media, one of the very first people to really uh, begin to write in earnest and with a great amount of theoretical rigor on mass media and the kinds of things that were going on. Uh, one of the famous ideas that McLuhan uh, has given uh, to us is this notion of a global village. And he wrote in Understanding Media, as you can see in 1964, after 3,000 years of specialist explosion and of increasing specialism and alienation in technological extensions of our body, uh, this is, you know, ability to, to fly and move and, you know, invention of the canoe and things like that and the boats, the world has become compressed by dramatic reversal. So he says, for thousands of years, what have we done? Built things to allow us to travel around. Right to to uh, by by air, well, eventually by air, but certainly by water first of all, then by land, and he says, you know, this is what we spend three thousand years doing, moving around the surface of the earth. Now all of a sudden we're moving backwards, and that contraction to move backwards uh, relative to what we were doing. He says, uh, the globe is no more than simply a village. So the notion of a, of a global village comes from that. The fact that we are able to connect around the world through communications, right? Communication technology. Uh, first of all, it was a telephone. Uh, now it's satellite TV and computers, the internet and, and all these particular things. So Baraka tries to embrace this idea of a global village. Uh, and in that global village, we're look, we're comparing and contrasting, right? Because that's typically what's going on in this film is we compare and contrast the world around and we see some of the things that are similar as well as some of the things that are vastly different and almost exotically different because this is the kind of thing that is happening in, in Baraka. Uh, we aren't explained, uh, it doesn't explain itself clearly as to where we are, who we are watching, is this a, a, a secular ceremony, a sacred ceremony? For the most part, they are sacred. Um, and expressions of uh, religious devotion, for example, but also expressions of, of technology, uh, because technology up to this point has been to move us further and further away from the world. And along comes this notion of a global village where through uh, technology that is communic communicative, right? It's communication technology that is bringing us together, bringing us closer together. So there is this weird paradox with the invention of mass media and communications that the world now is, seems to be getting smaller. So the film tries to, to uh, work with this idea, think through this idea of the global village. Uh, and the film certainly uh, is a global cultural form because there is something called world cinema and there are films being made and shot around the world, uh, films made shot on video as well. Um, it's also a product that is understood around the world. These days we can show a film to literally anyone and they understand exactly what it is that they're seeing. They understand the nature of cinema. Uh, it can also trans transmit across cultural boundaries, linguistic boundaries as well. Uh, it does talk about ideologies that are specific to a particular country, uh, mythologies that are also specific to the country and also that are um, universal. But we also have to admit that this kind of communication for the most part has been somewhat one-sided. It's been a kind of a one-way street where developed nations peer into developing nation, the nations and there's not a whole lot of the of, of a dialogue. It is more sort of a one-way street or one-way communication, which is with the advent of video, the advent of cell phones, for example, rapidly changing. So this is not something that certainly at the time that McLuhan was writing in the early 60s, it was a kind of one-way street. Uh, it was discussing many things that were simply our view of the world. And we were not asking a whole lot of questions back then. So does that sound kind of familiar? Keep that thought in mind as we work through this material. So Baraka is certainly um, embracing the notion of a global village by comparing and contrasting the world around us. It's a, an example of a transmission being becoming so, more or less equal. Uh, technology is advancing to the point where it is kind of leveling the playing field, we can say. Um, but what's also happening is when we talk about a global village and we talk about filmmaking in general, 
uh, because there are so many international agreements and international productions around the world, uh, it's hard to say that a film comes from a particular place. A film could be or could appear to be uh, an American movie, an American Hollywood movie, typical thing. And yet it's made with Japanese money or with West German, uh, West German, with German money. There is no more West Germany. Um, it could be done using international money. And so the country of origin for a lot of films is come somewhat problematic. And then also, also you can say, well, look, in Hollywood, you could have as many, uh, you know, actors from Australia as Canada as, as from the U.S. Because we know quite a few uh, Australian and Canadian actors have done very well in Hollywood and continue to work and still work today. So the notion of a film or the film's you know country of origin kind of problematic so we're, we're actually closer to something like a transnational cinema because it is it is something that is simply uh the way that business is being done these days uh simply well be, partly because films cost so much money and and money needs to be raised internationally uh so the notion of a film's country of origin is is kind of problematic it doesn't mean it's it's a necessarily a bad thing but we need to be clear that Films are not necessarily American, you know, or French or German or British. Uh, the money that's used to create them can come from uh, anywhere in the world. So Bill Nichols, to get back to uh, Nichols' uh, idea, he also thinks that films can be broken down, like documentary films, uh, in three sort of main categories here. Uh, historiographic, these are political documentaries. Um, you could, in a kind of sort of haphazard way, say that Man with a Movie Camera may fall under that because it does have a Marxist agenda. You know, this new world that is based on communist principles of equality, uh, workers' own means of production and all the rest of it. So it's, it's historiographic in that it is a, a political document. Its political agenda isn't so absolutely explicit in the message, but when we stop to think about it, we can we can fathom it out pretty quickly. Uh, ethnographic films; uh, these are uh, typically films that document societies that are that are threatened by global modernity. We could say that Nanook of the North is a, an ethnographic film if it was documenting a society that was rapidly, uh, you know, evolving into a more modern way of life uh, using, you know, guns rather than harpoons, for example. So that film is ethnographic. And finally, we have ecological films, and these are nature documentaries that we find on, you know, IMAX theaters, if those things are even still around, but you can find those on Netflix. Um, nature documentaries, beautifully shot, high-speed film, crisp, crisp images, um, the the brightest kinds of colors. They're almost sort of designed to to showcase the camera. You know, look at what the camera can do, uh, much like the the, the Ziga Vertov film, right? This is a mechanical eye, not a human eye. So we are going to consider these things, these three sort of forms, uh, the categories of the documentary film, as we watch uh, Baraka, because um, Baraka is partly ethnographic. Uh, it is partly historiographic because it does have an agenda, but it's certainly ecological as well. So again, these are, are not sort of uh, a neat fit. Uh, so we could say that certainly Baraka fits in any one of these, but it also sort of transcends all three of them. Um, and it could also be, you know, in terms of the music, the music has a lot to do with setting the, the, the tone, uh, that very mystical tone, exotic tone, uh, of the film and the, really the music and the imagery work very well together. If there is a kind of narrative flow, it is actually with the music more so than anything else. Because remember, no intertitles, no voiceover, no actors telling us what to think. So Baraka fits into some of those categories, but certainly transcends it to a great degree. So are there parallels to Nanook of the North? Well, I've just mentioned them. Uh, this idea of looking in on a culture that is possibly threatened by technology and, and uh, modernity. Um, does a film celebrate uh, something? Well, it does celebrate uh, religious, you know, devotion in one way or another. Um, it celebrates just the absolute ravishing beauty of nature, but also hidden within that message is the encroachment of technology, the encroachment of individuals, of Western, of Western ways and Western technology that is disseminating that world, um, or sorry, not disseminating, but decimating that world very quickly. So 
Could we ask ourselves, is there an, an overall message? Is there through intellectual montage, right? Or that overtonal montage that Eisenstein speaks of, is there a message? Well, yeah, we can, we can say that there are messages. There are several of them. Um, there are sort of smaller societies that are sort of organic and harmonious and are held together through uh, often religious ceremonies. There is also this absolutely breathtaking, awe-inspiring view of nature. And usually the more awe-inspiring, the better. Uh, we see a lot of, you know, speeded up movement of clouds and, and water. We, fl we fly over waterfalls. I mean, these are things we cannot do, right? The human eye cannot do that, but certainly a camera can. Uh, there's also the notion of humanity interacting with technology, interacting with modernity. And I think the political agenda, the kind of intellectual montage that is happening uh, as the shots are considered together as a whole, is certainly the notion of human destruction, uh, a, a sense of genocide. And the way in which these sequences are strung together, both individually and collectively, the entire sort of sense of collage, uh, the overall kind of overtonal or intellectual themes that are coming through are the ones that we can see here. Uh, the human, the interaction of humans with modernity and technology, the destructive nature of that interaction that leads often to genocide. Uh, but we see sort of the hope in these smaller, organic, harmonious communities that are, that are held together and still believe in that religious ceremony that is very important to see. Now, do we, can we make the argument that we are essentially barbaric, right? That we just are simply hurting the, the planet, destroying it without even caring? Well, the fact that this, excuse me, the fact that this movie exists is telling us that no, we don't think this way. Uh, we are trying to save the planet and certainly any environmentalist would embrace this movie and the message that this movie has, which is that we live on this sacred planet. This planet is sacred. That is the Baraka. That is the essence of, of, of the earth. It is sacred and it should be respected. And if we don't, um, then we are going to destroy the only, the, the only vessel that we have. There are no other planets we can move to in the foreseeable future. And if we destroy this one, we destroy ourselves. And are we barbaric in terms of technology and business and capitalism? Absolutely. In terms of humanity, I think there are many human beings that are absolutely against this idea. Because you know what? We're the ones who need to live there. Uh, capitalists, yeah, they do too as well, but they seem to be less concerned. They're more concerned that, you know, by the time this is beyond uh, repair, I'm long gone, which is a horrible way to look at things. So humanity, although we are living in this modern world, uh, Baraka, I think, reminds us that we are living part of the, in this global organism, this harmonious, organic, uh, you know, gl uh, globe that is really Gaia. This is this idea that is presented to us, that we are on this vessel together and we need to respect the earth. We need to respect the essence of the earth and celebrate in some way. Now, some ideas that have been brought uh, um, towards uh, Baraka negative, uh, we'll say, is this idea of the film exhibiting a kind of imperialistic uh, nostalgia. You know, it's looking back on the things that that imperialism has utterly destroyed. Because without imperialism, there would not be the encroachment of modernity and technology. So it's looking back and uh, with a certain degree of guilt, uh, looking at the things that we have done. We're mourning the passing of something that we have destroyed. So we need to remember that. So there is the guilt, right, of developed nations being col uh, colonial powers. Right? It's, it's us. It's us who have done it. It's the, it's the West. It is uh, the Occidental world not the oriental world that has destroyed itself, we have done it. And so that's why we see sweatshops, shanty towns, you know, the degree of ho homelessness and, and poverty. Uh, this is what we see when we look at uh, Baraka, that uh, it does display a kind of imperialistic nostalgia, uh, a, a kind of guilt trip. So it does show very clearly how the world is being destroyed by the first world, the developed nations, uh, economically, culturally, ecologically, and yet at the same time, it has, it has a nostalgia for the you know what Jean Jacques Rousseau used to call the noble savage, right? The noble noble savage that is uncorrupted by the very the very world that we represent, right? The natural world that came before, uh, through obviously the depictions of nature, tribal societies, harmonial uh, or harmonious organic societies that are still linked deeply to the earth, and of course pre-modern religions that we see. 
all of this is part of that nostalgia of the very things that we unfortunately are the ones who have destroyed. So the opening sequence in particular, I want you to, to pay attention to and have a look at uh, because it is really an excellent example of uh, a kind of poetic documentary. Uh, and as uh, Nichols says, exploring associations and patterns that involve temporal rhythms, uh, spatial uh, juxtapositions, uh, sort of extreme close-ups and wide panoramic shots, um, the temporal rhythms that follow sometimes in music and other times not, but overall a very poetic introduction. Uh, it really sets a mood. It sets a very particular mood in this film, which is quite remarkable. So uh, it's 55 minutes here. I'm going to bring the last set of slides here uh, just in a moment uh, and to talk about uh, Kunitskawa in just a second. Okay, so in this last part here, the last set of slides, uh, I just want to again talk about poetic and reflexive documentaries. Uh, poetic documentaries, again, uh, they're non-narrative, they're almost kind of intuitive, uh, they're unconventional, but certainly non-narrative in the sense of they're not busy telling us an explicit story with a beginning, middle, and end. That's typically what a narrative is. Uh, and it doesn't even change that order up, you know, give us the ending and then how do we get here? It doesn't even do that. It's literally non-narrative. And the effect is cumulative. We are going to watch the whole series of images, individual sequences, uh, a range of sequences strung together with an overall impact. So individual events and characters are undeveloped typical or, or compared to a narrative film. Uh, there's, there is no character development. Uh, we see people that are interacting with their environments and we are watching them. And periodically, as I've met, uh, pointed out earlier, uh, sometimes the, the characters look straight at us. They, they look not necessarily in, a, in an accusatory fashion, right? They're accusing us of doing something. But certainly you can read that into their faces because we are coming from the first world to their nation with our camera, our technology, uh, and looking at the devastation, right? The, the fact that we've decimated part of their world and they're looking right back at us. They're accusing us of that and we're guilty. So that you get that sense, that's intentional. Now, uh, continuity is less important in terms of matching on action. As like I said, where, uh, each shot follows inexorably from the previous one. It, it doesn't. It can shift back and forth. It can go from one part of the world to another part of the world. But there's something you can ask yourself, yourself and go, why were those two shots put together? And that's where that intellectual montage can start to work. It creates a, a, a new meaning, right? A meaning that is not specifically in the shots themselves, but are the, are the result of the combination of, of two or more shots together. So we have associations and patterns for temporal rhythms. Uh, all of this is, in, is important in the kind of filmmaking that we're seeing here. So uh, reflexive modes uh, talk about the, the quality of documentary filmmaking, the degree to which we can capture the truth, very difficult. Um, it's about the process of making a, a documentary. Uh, in the fog of war, for example, we're going to do, deal with that more so. But certainly poetic modes are what uh, are paramount in the two films to watch today. And again, um, you know, with reflexive to aid the audience in their understanding of the process of construction in films so they could develop a sophisticated and critical attitude. Well, think back to Man with the Movie Camera. We see the cameraman in the shot, the cameraman taking the shots. We see the editor putting together shots that we will see. So reflexive can be to that degree where uh, we get we get to view what exactly is going on, what what the magic of filmmaking actually is. So, um, but poetic and, and reflexive, uh, most poetic documentaries have reflexive elements. That is true because they are asking us to consider why these shots are strung together, and that new meaning is not specific to the shots, but is specific to the sequence of shots, of, of shots together. So they are reflexive to that degree, but we can certainly have films that question re, uh, or reflect and are reflexive to a greater degree, and we'll see that in films like Fog of War. Uh, but here, uh, they are reflexive in asking us to, to think back on what it is we're watching. And so when we're looking at films, the voiceover narration, uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, Leonard Cohen and Nuke of the North and others, uh, these are very straightforward. 
Um, this, the uh, participatory films, uh, where you increase the subjectivity, Roger and me, um, uh, Michael Moore is specifically in a variety of shots. He, we hear his voiceover. He controls a narrative. It is a very subjective experience. So it's participatory as well. Um, uh, Cinema Verité is, uh, is kind of like watching uh, like a, a fly in the wall. Uh, that is very important because when we think of, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, Cinema Verité, uh, Leonard Korn is, is more engaged with what's going on. Because remember at the tail end, when we see um, uh, Leonard Cohen himself talking about watching himself sleeping, writing caveat emptor. So he's, he's interacting uh, in a very explicit way with the presence of the filmmaker and or the camera. So... Each of these films do make various arguments. Uh, and so the films I'd like you to, to watch, uh, these are, you know, these are worth looking at because we want to think of what the argument actually is. Um, and the argument in, uh, uh, Kuinitsitsatsky, I really have a lot of difficulty saying that. Uh, and I apologize. Uh, but in that film, there is also an argument. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Reggio, uh, talks about the massive destruction of the earth. Uh, in a similar way to, to Baraka, but more explicitly. And he says these films have never been about the effect of technology, of industry on people. It's been that everyone, politics, education, things of a financial structure, capitalism, the nation state structure, political structures, language, all these things exist within a host, you know, within the host of technology. So all of these things we can think about in the film and how they all impact in different ways the fact that technologically speaking it's hard to get out from underneath it uh, technology parades everywhere so the film is about the slow disintegration of the natural world um, a world that is somehow made of you know convenience and throwaway objects and pollution technology uh, there is a clip for you to watch it's i think it's it's just maybe a five or six minute piece uh, but do have a look at it uh, but baraka is is our main feature film i want you to focus more on that one so that's essentially it. Uh, these are the arguments. Uh, do have a look at the slides as well. Uh, you can read on, but I think this is kind of the essence of what I wanted to discuss today. Uh, the, the poetic form, the non-linear, non-narrative, uh, sort of very expressionistic sometimes style of filmmaking that asks us to make our decisions about what we see. Uh, and it has to do with uh, Eisenstein's tonal, overtonal, and intellectual forms of montage. Uh, so do have a look at all those. Uh, the last thing I also want to remind you of, and we'll talk about it also in the uh, on Wednesday when we see each other for the Zoom, that there is also a, a reading quiz, and that is the chapter "Peace Between Man and Machine: Ziga Vertov's Man with a Movie Camera," and it's on pages 19 to 34. And the quiz is also available from January 25th to 31st. The last thing I want to say is a couple of you have, con have uh, contacted me via email concerned about your marks for the viewing quiz fear not when it's done i go in and i mark the the uh, answers myself because fol if it doesn't see exactly the answer i've given it it calls it says it's wrong so let's say the answer is you know one word and you write in two words fol says wrong even if one of those two words is in fact correct so i'm, I'm going to go in so if you see zero out of 11 or one out of 11 don't panic i'm going in to read those answers and that's just for the viewing quiz the uh, the, the uh, writing quiz like the quizzes on the readings um not writing the reading quizzes uh those are done with multiple choice so that answer is in fact correct but i just wanted to state now that the viewing quiz i am marking not fol so wait until i have a chance to get to it your mark always always will improve so in the meantime, thank you very much, and we'll see each other on uh, Wednesday.